Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Firebelly Social Show, where uh, I, your guest, Duncan Olney, interviews uh, leaders and founders and, and, and uh, just awesome people from food and beverage companies, and specifically from mission-driven food and beverage companies. And this episode is brought to you by Firebelly, uh, the agency that I founded, where we uh, have a growing niche in food and beverage um, clients, and we focus on making them more likable. And we work with some really big brands, and uh, we're, we're a courageous crew and uh, happy to do what we do. But I'm so excited today. Um, th- through this whole podcast series, I've not been able to interview uh, a whole lot of people that I know in person. And so I'm so excited to uh, to have my my friend Carolyn Hadlock here today. And she is the ECD and a principal at the almost always hot Young and Laramore, um, based out of Indianapolis, but doing um, national and global work. And she has founded the Beautiful Thinkers Project, um, which is a podcast. And she's doing it for such interesting reasons. I'm so excited. To, I'm, I'm, with no further ado, welcome, Carolyn. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Duncan, for having me. And I agree, as a fellow podcaster, it's so nice to actually do a podcast with somebody you've sat in the same room with. It's amazing. We have to give a shout out to the OG who has connected us, the David Hoppy. Who uh, is, yeah. You know, David Hoppy is just, he's that um, Richard Burton of our lives, you know, and the, the, the man with a plan and a point of view and, and who's willing to share <laughs> it and the author and just sort of the purveyor of, of style and cool things. So I'm glad for that I know him so I could meet you as well. So um so let so let's talk about your podcast. Um let's let's yeah. jump right into it, you know. Um it's it's called the uh, the Beautiful Thinkers Project. Tell us how you came up with the name. Well it's an interesting evolution. So I started this when I was at the agency and I became the first executive creative director the agency had had. Prior to that, it had just gone up to creative direction with David Young and Jeff Laramore. And as we began to grow, it became apparent we needed to deepen the bench a little bit. So so my remit is really, you know, reputation building and thought leadership and recruiting and and new business. And so I kind of took a step back. And since I I was no longer responsible for day-to-day workings of my clients, it gave me an opportunity to take a step back and kind of become a student of the industry again and just really soak up um, good work out there all around the world in all forms, not just advertising, but whether it might be set design, it might be um, a music score, whatever it may be that contributes to, to things. And as I was talking to one of our creative directors about this and trying to identify kind of a theme and, and something I could rally around, we kind of came up with the thought of beautiful thinking. And we really liked that idea because beautiful thinking is, it's visual on the surface. You might just think it's thinking made aesthetically beautiful, but it, it's not, it's much deeper than that. So we started uh, with actually a Tumblr blog, remember Tumblr back in the day um, called Unoya. And Unoya means beautiful thinking in Greek. And it's the shortest word in the English language that contains all five vowels. So for those two reasons alone, we just invested in it. And then I interviewed a lot of creatives from a lot of the work that I admired all around the world. Um, and at that point, it was just written. And then I decided to take it off of Tumblr um, into a more multimedia space. And that's when the podcast came into play. And I also found, while beautiful thinking is still the heart of it, I really was motivated and passionate about the thinkers behind the thinking. And I think I've always been drawn to people's stories and biographies and finding the, just the true sort of inner workings, you know, not just the glossy things we hear about or read about on the news, but the struggles and, and the setbacks um, that they go through. Because I, I take personally a lot of um, inspiration from that kind of courage and bravery. And I think there's, there's not enough commiseration in this industry. I think there's a lot of posturing in this industry. And so I kind of wanted to break down those walls and so now, um, and then at the same time, I also um, took a step back. My CEO at the time said, you know, have you thought about interviewing uh, beautiful thinkers that are not in the creative discipline? And it was it was one of those things, Duncan. It was just like, 
Well, duh. Yeah, no, I haven't, but of course. And I, I have to say, I love the space. I love talking to people who are doing really creative things, mavericks in their own space, originals in their own right, and telling their stories, whether it's somebody who's a physicist at MIT who uh, created a writing tract there for the physicists to be able to communicate their ideas, or if it's, you know, just recently, um, the founders of Mom Water, which is, I know, a brand you and I have t- talked about a little bit, we want to give a shout out to because it's a new brand on the market, Indiana founded, and it's now really taking hold all around the country. That's amazing. And that is, if I remember correctly, Bryce and Jill Morrison that are doing that. That's right. Correct. I, I did not know yeah. that they were, it was, um, and they really, you know, just uh, thinking of that since you brought it up. They really just saw something that they wanted. Yeah, well, that is so that's the other thing. I've also always been very passionate about product development and how things come into being. And and I see so many brands just create product for the wrong reasons. They're just trying to keep up. They're trying to revitalize themselves, find relevancy. But the ones that really look at it from a consumer problem, those are the ones that are really great. And I and through this project, I have found a lot of those people tend to be, you know, a lot of those people tend to be entrepreneurial. So in the case of mom water, they uh, have kids and they have a pool and they do a lot of entertaining. And uh, she would, Jill would have an adult beverage in a water bottle. And one day her child did not realize that's what it was and took a sip. And so then I think she was like, oh, I should probably do something to delineate, you know? And so that's when uh, she and her husband talked about creating mom water, um, which also is really interesting because I feel like small people like that can really defy. I'm not sure that somebody from a big beverage industry would tackle it because they didn't know what they were getting into and how hard it was going to be. And I love telling that story. I love telling the story of kind of breaking through because it's basically a non-carbonated um ready to drink beverage, but it has vodka in it. It's not classified as beer. That creates a whole level, as you know, in this industry of distribution wrinkles. And it's a, it's a flat beverage with vodka and it's all natural. And they refuse to, you know, sort of be taken in by the efficiencies and the margins. And they really stuck to their guns and they made a product they're really proud of and, and has created really a community. And, and I think back to my mom, you know, and the same thing, I remember every once in a while, picking up a glass of water, I thought was water and it was not. So it comes from a kind of a funny human insight. So I, I love that. That's a beautiful story. Um, I know that there, that, that sort of like uh, behavior is not uncommon, right? To have your coffee and, you know, that's with you all the time or your wine that's in your, in your to go cup, you know, so yeah. it makes sense because, um, yeah, I mean that's it's a lifestyle, and to, to have the insight into the lifestyle that seems to be something I'm I'm seeing with with founders in general mm-hmm. is they see something, and they don't give up on it, you know, uh, yeah. and, then, and they just kind of follow along with it. Um, um, I, I was, uh, and you know, and, and founder life is difficult. I was uh, interviewing Justin, and he's he's the the founder of uh, a company called Kapow, and then Awakened Life, and they do like uh, heritage. Uh, corn yeah. um, based products, but uh, snacks. And he was saying it's the two by four rule. And I was, I said, what is the two by four rule? And he says, you're going to, what get, is the two by four rule? You're going to get hit, well, you know, uh, a few times a week <laughs> in the head with a two by four as a, as a founder and entrepreneur. And you're going to have to get up and keep going. <laughs> so, yeah. And, you know, here, and people like the, like the Pierce's, you know, they're, um, they're, they're following that, that life. And uh, so, so, um, so let's talk about you. You just finished and you and dropped your fourth season of the podcast. And yeah. um, tell us about the fourth season. What makes it unique? So the fourth season is really unique because I started theming them. And that you know, people would ask me, "How do I? How do you pick the people you pick?" And and I did not have a good answer for it. So uh, our somebody on our team was like, "Maybe we need a theme." So. Um, this last theme is mother and it's not mother in the way it is mother in the way you think of it in the traditional sense. I do find when I talk to a lot of people outside of the season throughout all of my interviews, I do always like to ask the question, 
how your mother influenced you? Because we hear a lot about how dads influence us in the professional space, but a lot of times moms are kind of, you know, kept to the more personal space. And I think there's some of my favorite answers have been when I've asked them that question and it kind of, you know, disrupts their, their brains a little bit and makes them think about it. And, and I think about their path in kind of a unique way. And so I really like that, but I also have been studying both through the pandemic and the women in leadership um, in the three countries that have at least first time around brought the country uh, back to a shred of normalcy quicker than others, we're all led by women. And I think there's something really interesting about that. And so I really wanted to explore um, the gender, non-gendered um, characteristics of, of maternal, you know, m- characteristics that all modern leaders whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're not, you mean non-binary, whatever your your orientation is, I think the, the best leaders are the ones that use all range of emotions and all range of um, characteristics. So for example, we think about business to date has been very male-centric. And so it's been more about power when I think, you know, bringing the maternal lens into it, it's more about empowerment. Um, another example is, um, we think about uh, competition, you know, to date, it's been, you know, being highly competitive. And I think bringing in the maternal lens, it's more about collaboration. So I just think there's, you know, instead of networking, it's networking thinking, which is what you and I are doing right now. We're sharing, we're sharing thoughts. You and I could easily compete on a piece of business and, but that's okay. You know, I think we're here to sort of like elevate everybody to a, a different space. So so I really wanted to talk to men and women and, and all, all ranges of people um, about this theory. And some were moms. Um, I interviewed also Martha Hoover, who is the uh, founder of Padishu, um Inc. and the Padishu Foundation. And normally I interview people from everywhere. And this particular season had two Indiana people, which I was really excited about because I think Martha really pioneered the Indiana um, seen with uh, her culinary infusion and what she's done to the city to help the city has just been tremendous. And so, um, but I also interviewed Kevin Lynch, you know, who is um, a creative director at Oatly. He's now in Malmo, Sweden, uh, by way of Chicago. And I love that idea too, because it's a different application. So that, you know, would be mother nature. And I think about mom water was, you know, necessity as a mother of invention. And it also happened to have the word mom in it. So these are all the different dimensions that I wanted to explore. I mean, it's it's fascinating how you brought it together. And I know the other one um, that you didn't mention, Courtney Morgan, um, a creative director at the Recrafted Collection for Patagonia. These are yeah. all, all people who are who have, as you say, that mother instinct that is um, strong and um, it seems omnipresent in their work. So yeah. that's really fascinating. How about like give give us a snippet of, or, or two of some of your favorite stories from 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 the season? Well, I interviewed um, Susan Holmes McKagan, who is the wife of bassist Duff McKagan of Guns N' Roses, and I really liked it because she's very different from anybody that I've I've interviewed, and I was connected to her through a friend of mine um, as I was looking to find somebody who was a mom, but also in a very uh, non-traditional way, but also had, you know, traditional sort of um, a backbone to it. So uh, he connected me to her and she was just so amazing because, you know, she's the wife of a rock star on the road all the time. She's been married, I think, 22 years or no more. It has to be 24. And she has two girls And they're both ones pursuing fashion, which she also was um, still is a model, but was one of the also original supermodels, you know, back in the 80s. And so I just think her point of view on the world is very unique. And hearing her talk about being in pandemic and hearing her talk about the fact that she took a writing course at Harvard um, as a form of self-care. And I just I loved that. You know, here's somebody who, who on the outside And she does. She's all she talks about how blessed she is. And she is very blessed, but also somebody who wants to become 
um, who wants to continue to learn and who is curious and who isn't just resting on their laurels and who does have two girls, you know, I mean, there's always stuff connected to that who live in different parts of the country than them. So I really like talking to her about um, her life and what it's like to find partnership with your partner, who also happens to be a world famous rock musician. And they do a podcast together as well um, on music. So I, I just, I love talking to her and understanding that it is possible to have multiple dimensions. You know, a lot of times, even today, people are forced into one of the things I hate as far as it goes with motherhood is people will say, well, you can have everything, but not all at the same time. And it really, it really hits me wrong because nobody tells men that, you know, and, and I think Susan kind of defies that because she did all of these things very fluidly. And I think we all have that ability. And so I have a daughter too. She's 24 and she's in law school and I have a son who I want to, you know, have him respect and see women as, as every bit as um, capable and passionate and purposeful as they are. So it's just my little way of kind of breaking a little light into it. And Martha was great too. Again, she's a mother as well, but she's a daughter and she's a wife. And so I just think it's so interesting as we think about, you know, our professional journeys and our personal lives and how those two things weave together and how they can really inform each other. Um, one of my favorites, and this isn't from the season, but I interviewed Kara Golden, who is the founder of Hint Water. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I follow her. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, necessity is a mother of invention. And she was trying to get off Diet Coke. And she um, started making her own fruit infused water and she was drinking it. And then her kids started drinking it. And then her friends came over and they started drinking it. And she had no background in beverage, just as Martha had no background in restaurant, restaurant um, management, or even being a chef. And so, so Kara just decided to, to go for it and, and turn this thing into a business. And now I think it's just shy if it's not just past a billion dollar business. But, um, you know, I love those stories. I love sharing those stories because I feel like everybody has that creativity in them. But it's that two by four, right? Like, we either don't want it or we don't see it coming or we're not able to get back up. And it takes so much tenacity. And so I, I, I love just bringing all those stories to life. I mean, it's, it's interesting the, you know, the commitment that it takes to do, you know, what, um, what super um, successful people who are, who are, uh, I guess, aware and utilize that creative muscle on a regular basis. Yeah. We all have it, right? We all have it. Everyone has it. Doesn't matter where you are, you know where your what your position is or what walk of life you're in. Everyone has creativity at the core yeah. of their um, of their being. You know whether you're taking a shortcut to school or you're you know finding a, a way to carry water differently or whatever it is. And it's interesting. Yeah, I love because, that. It's interesting because uh, as I was prepping, uh, the, the Kevin Lynch interview. It, kept jumping out, out. I mean, listen to several, but that one kept jumping out at me. Uh, it, it really felt like we're sitting in, um, in a room with you too on, on a, on an armchair while you guys were, were shooting the breeze. But the fact that you know, I want, wanted to ask you what, cause you didn't really give a reaction on this during the interview. Um, when he said that creativity is at the core of Oatly. Yeah. And how, what are your thoughts on that with some of the guests you've had? You know, what role um, does not just creativity, but the recognition that creativity coupled with bravery at the core of these enterprises? It's huge. It's huge. I mean, you know, what one thing is, and that is, I think Oatly is unique in that. And I think what's unique about Oatly in particular is they're also, they're big now. They just went public and they're, I mean, they're global. And so just, it's one thing to, to say you're that when you, you know, are, you have one market or you're just getting started. It's another thing to scale across the world and still say that. Um, yeah, I was blown away by that, Duncan. And that was one of the reasons, I mean, I've known Kevin for a while and he is just one of the most creative people I know. But when he went to Oatly, I was just like, oh, of course he did. Of course, it's a perfect match. Um, but I think it, it really is important to recognize that because you're right. I mean, I've, all, I've often said if I could 
if I could eliminate something, it would be the phrase people saying I'm not creative. It makes me crazy. Everybody, like you just said, everybody's creative. We just don't recognize it as a creative act, right? And so I think it's important to bring these lessons to our, to the agency and to our clients. You know, we use a lot of the learnings here and the insights to talk with our clients and, and help them see, Hey, there's, you know, Oatly works hard to have creativity at their core. Lego works hard to have creativity at their core. Dove works hard to have creativity at their core. And what I love about it is they're showing that not only does it make people feel more like they have a sense of purpose. And so people tend to go and stay at those brands, but it is really good business, you know, and you talked about in the beginning, Duncan, about mission, mission led brands. And that's something I've really been inspired by. And purpose is something that, you know, comes up again and again, like you said, Courtney at Patagonia. I mean, I loved it when she said, you know, when I first started the company, it was like, I felt like I was a Jedi, like joining the Jedi force, you know, and, and, and I really think that's true. And I think that's so inspiring. So it's always, I would say that probably is beautiful thinking in its core, right. It's just like that active creativity, or if you want to call it innovation, or, you know, if you want to call it whatever you want to call it, but that is something I think that is consistent across everybody I talk to. And I think that's part of that. If you look at the people I talk to, it probably doesn't make sense on the face. But then if you hear their stories, that is universal truth. How they use creativity, whether it's through responding to something, getting back up, seeing an opportunity, whatever that may be, um, that really was an act of bravery and creativity. Because I think being creative is an act of bravery. You know, I mean, I think that those two things are so intertwined. Yeah, yeah. Um... I know you know um, of Duncan Wardle. He's the um, only cool um, Duncan, uh, other than uh, other than me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I should say the only other Duncan that I know. That uh, and it's an uncommon name, right? And and so D- Duncan Wardle, uh, former uh, chief of innovation at Disney, and I um, um, saw him speak and, and got to meet him for a few minutes uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I was struck by when he was saying the exact same thing that you just said, it's about, you know, uh, everyone is creative. And he said, I hate it when they call them the creative team or, you know, yes, we're bringing totally. the, we are bringing the creative people in, you know, and he says, there's a lot of pressure. He said, and, and, and he says, I always tell people that one of the easiest ways, you know, to exercise your creative muscle is to look at a roadblock and flip it over. Like flip the yeah. flip, flip it on its head and say, hey, what if I wasn't pressured in this situation? How could I approach it differently? How how would the outcome be different? Do I care if the outcome's different? So, you know, it I love it, that. It takes courage to do that though, because I think, you know, we're taught to be compliant. We're taught to just kind of follow the rules. And, oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. you know. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that because uh so Alessandra Manfredi, who is the um He's a VP of the Dove brand at Unilever, and he's been on the brand since self-esteem started back in the early 90s. So he's OG um, self-esteem. And it was so funny. It wasn't until the very end we were talking about the work that he's doing. Amazing, amazing work that he's doing. And he said, um, he goes, you know what? When I was little, I really loved. Oh, sorry, Duncan. No, it's life. Um. He was saying, uh, I thought I wanted to, um, I really wanted to be creative. And what I find is a lot of these people um, aren't creative because um, they don't know how to draw, essentially. That, so it comes down to you are sort of broken of your creativity when, um, when you're a kid, you know, and it usually happens around the, eight of, the age of like eight or nine. And so I just loved that when he talked about, um, the fact that he used to love to draw. And then I think one day his teacher said, Oh, or, um, Oh, Alessandro, you probably, you probably shouldn't draw or you're not as creative, or I don't remember exactly, but whatever was said to him took him down this like lifelong journey of wanting to be around creativity, but he came at it as more of a strategist, and a, you know, um, the VP of marketing. And it just kills me because I mean, clearly he's one of the most creative people I have ever talked to. 
Um, but it's just, it's, it's a crazy lens that, you know, people sort of, I don't know, they, they kind of lull themselves into thinking that that's, that's who they are or who they're not. And it's, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. I just made a note to myself to change our photography, videography and designer team to the visual team, as opposed to the creative services team. So I'm, I'm going to make that happen. <laughs> See, there you go. I like it. Let me, let me ask you this. What's next for, uh, are you already thinking about the next season? I am. So we try and do four seasons a year and the, and the team, um, and I were just talking about this before we were leaving for break about the next season. I think it's going to be something around, um, youth. I think there's something really interesting. This, I, I love, I love generation Z. I think it's a, a really cool generation. And I think there's just a lot of hope um, for this generation, you know, they, I think maybe they'll understand the role of digital in their lives more than, than people like you and I do, because they don't know life without it. Um, so I think it's going to be something around what they're up to and, um, how they're changing the world, but we haven't really got into it further than that. Well, we, we, we can't wait to hear more about it. Uh, any, any, uh, what, what, what is your favorite beverage? Oh, well, I had multiple favorite beverages. Um, I, I love, I love wines. I've always loved wines. So um, I have not talked to anybody yet in that space. I would love to, um, but I also love the craft of, of spirits. Um, and, you know, I love what Diageo is doing. You know, I talked to their um, head of North American whiskeys and just the way they're, there's just something about spirits and the way it, captures celebration and culture and a lot of the work um, that that this woman's doing in her space is really is really cool. Um, but I also love coffees. I love um, a lot of local stuff. I love Oatly. I love the barista um, milk. It's great for frothing for lattes. Um, but I, I, I love just the, how quickly the space moves and just how it's always centered around some kind of occasion or moment, you know? The lifestyle aspect. I love it. I remember yeah. being in wine training and um, uh, years ago and uh, the guy that was doing the, the wine training, I said, you know, how do you tell someone that it's a really good wine? And they say, well, how can it be really good? It's only $24. And he said, you say it's a lifestyle wine. And when they <laughs> say to you, well, what does that mean? And say, well, whatever you want it yeah. to mean, it, it fits into your life, you know? And so whether, whether it's a high point or a low point, the wine's there with you. So, well. That's cool. That's very um, cool. Any, any, uh, any last words or, 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 or some advice that you want to you uh, send out into the, into the uh, universe? No, you know, I think the thing is just one of my favorite things that Susan um, Holmes McKagan said was... I, I also don't really like the phrase, there's always somebody in the room that's smarter than you. Um, Cause I just feel like that's kind of one dimensional, but I, I loved it when she talked about it and she said, there's always going to be someone who's cooler than you and smarter than you. And, and, you know, has more money than you. I mean, there's always going to be the more than, but I think the the thing that I hope people do is to never feel like they're coming from a deficit, never, you know, always feel like they are, um, coming to the world with an original point of view that, that they should believe in and follow in and just not give up on it. So, you know, if your, your podcast or my podcast, if there's anything inside of that or anybody, there's so many out there, um, books that can help you find that confidence. I mean, that's what it's all about. And in my work is really in the professional space and helping people find their place, you know, and not be afraid to ask questions and to be curious and to, and to always learn. So I would just say, just eliminate that phrase. Think of yourself, embrace your creativity in whatever form that comes in. And recognize that we all have something amazing to give, right? It's like everyone yeah. from, uh, I, 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 you know, I was recently in Calcutta and uh, I did like a portrait um, of, a, of a rickshaw uh, driver. And um I was talking to him and someone, you know, one of the people that the, the tea shop at the tea shop said, why do you talk to a rickshaw driver? What has he got to say? And I said, he has an amazing story. Like, you know, this yeah. guy is like doing something that most people don't want to do. He's running every day, you know, and anyway, so we all have something amazing to bring to the table. 
Uh, Caroline, thank you for your courage and, 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 and showing us the way and, 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 and doing this important creative work. And I look forward to the next season and I encourage everyone to listen uh, and, and to the last season with the strong motherhood theme. And uh, how can they find both the podcast and you? Well, the, the beautiful thinkers project.com is the website um, that the team just did. It's brand new. It looks really nice. And then on Instagram, it's at the beautiful thinkers. And then on LinkedIn, it's just my profile. So Carolyn Hadlock. So any of those ways, we'd love to hear from people and especially people have ideas that people they think would be good candidates to talk with. And Carolyn, we must go back to the uh, place you, I can't remember, it was the commissary? The commissary here. Yes, the that commissary. was so good. Exceptional world-class experience with drinks and, uh, you know, and cocktails and coffee right in the heart of downtown and uh, in a beautiful uh, old uh, space. So uh, thank you so much, Carolyn. And uh, this has thank been the, you, the Fire Belly Social Show where we interview uh, leaders from mission-driven food and beverage brands. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you on the flip side. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> Thanks, Duncan. Thanks for listening to the Fire Belly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.